Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Provision of Chaplaincy Services in U.S. Hospitals, a Strategic Conformity Perspective. I'm Andrew Andresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are all delighted you could join us. Some housekeeping instructions off the top. This webinar is being recorded. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. Should you have any technical questions regarding your audio or visual, please type those into the chat box located in the platform's dashboard. You'll have the opportunity to submit text questions for our presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of that same control panel. You can send them in at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and we hope to include them in the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. With that, I'd like to introduce Transforming Chaplaincy former director and current senior advisor, Dr. George Fichette. Andy, thanks so much for all your good help. Um, uh, friends, welcome. Glad to have you all with us today. Um, as we get started, let me just um, call your attention to uh, the slide you see on your screen. Transforming Chaplaincy has put together uh, an important series of webinars to help us celebrate Spiritual Care Week, which is the week of October 23rd. There will be webinars Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, all focused on the theme of chaplaincy and mental health. So if you click on the QR code or go to uh, uh, the URL there, um, uh, you'll see the details uh, about uh, the four webinars and you'll be able to register for them. Uh, and we hope you'll uh, find those beneficial uh, uh, for your uh, celebration of Spiritual Care Week. We also want to call your attention to the fact that as we do these webinars and um, uh, we're also launching uh, <clears throat> a new network, um, as many of you know, Transforming Chaplaincy does a lot of important work through eight or nine networks and we're now uh, with Spiritual Care Week going to be launching a chaplaincy and mental health care research network and we invite you to be part of that if that's an area of particular interest to you. Um, it's not on this slide but I want to draw your attention to the fact that on Thursday this week we're also uh, having a webinar uh, that will be um, at noon central time. Uh, the title of the webinar is Religion as a Social Determinant of Health, Explaining, Exploring Religious Attendance, Importance and Affiliation as predictors of adult mortality, and we're delighted to have as our presenter uh, Ellen Eidler, professor of sociology uh, at, at Emory University, who's been a good friend for Transforming Chaplaincy. So um, information about that webinar is in Transforming Chaplaincy's newsletter today uh, and on our website, and if that's an area of interest, we hope you'll join us on Thursday. It's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Um, uh, for a very important uh, webinar, as uh, Andy said, about provision of chaplaincy services in U.S. hospitals. Uh, joining us today uh, are Kelsey White, Dr. Kelsey White, board certified chaplain, assistant professor, the chaplain faculty researcher, chaplaincy faculty researcher in the Department of Patient Counseling in the College of Health Professions at Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. White is a health services researcher whose research has focused on access to and quality of professional spiritual care in health systems. And as many of you would know, Kelsey is also currently the editor in chief of the Journal of Healthcare Chaplaincy. And I wanna mention actually that when we started Transforming Chaplaincy, Wendy and I as co-directors um, in 2015, Kelsey was in the first class of Transforming Chaplaincy Research Fellows. And so it's been wonderful to work with Kelsey over all these years. Joining us uh, is also Dr. Daniel Lee. Daniel is the inaugural Martha V. and Wycliffe S. Lynn Professor of Health Administration, also in the College of Health Professions at Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. Lee is a health services researcher with a disciplinary background in organizational and medical sociology. The goal of Dr. Lee's research is to improve healthcare delivery through the critical examination of factors that drive organizational as well as individual decisions and behaviors. Dr. Lee, we're so glad to have you. Um, and joining us as a respondent to today's uh, presentation is Wendy Cadge. Many of you know Wendy is Professor of Sociology and the Barbara Mandel Professor of Humanistic Social Sciences at Brandeis University. 
Wendy is the founder and director of the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab. But I have to say, it's really uh, wonderful to have Wendy back because in 2015, Wendy and I uh, started transforming Chaplaincy together. And it's been uh, wonderful to have uh, the opportunity to work on that with Wendy. And then since the Innovation Lab developed, uh, kind of uh, be partners with uh, the Innovation Lab and with Wendy and her colleagues in the important work of strengthening spiritual care. So it's great to have you all here. Uh, uh, Kelsey uh, and Daniel, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thanks, George. Um, we're gonna take a second. I think Andy's gonna have to run some slides. He's gonna pull them up here in a second. Um, but it's a great honor to be here with you um, and my colleague, um, Dr. Daniel Lee. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about a paper that we have had published recently called um, Provision of Chaplaincy Services in U.S. Hospitals, a Strategic Conformity Perspective. Um, and the, um, thank you, Andy. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I apologize for having to say next slide. You know how computers can always make our lives lovely. Um, so we want to give you the full citation in case you wanna read this article after the webinar concludes. Um, we also wanna extend our gratitude to our co-authors and um, Dr. Laura McClellan, who is here at VCU, who provided some feedback. Um, and then as um, we do in most cases with research, need to do a little bit of disclosure. The research was supported in part by the Commonwealth Institute of Kentucky at the University of Louisville School of Public Health and Information Sciences. The views expressed here are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official position of CIK at the university. All right, next slide. So let me give you a large um, or a, a larger overview of kind of this paper and how it's positioned um, in and how it's relevant to chaplaincy. Um, so what the purpose of the paper was is to really look at a longitudinal examination of chaplaincy departments in adult acute care hospitals. So we looked from 2010 to 2019. There are other papers that have looked at um, the factor or looked at factors associated with having chaplaincy departments and chaplaincy services. Um, however, most of those are single year kind of snapshots. Uh, the other part of our analysis was that we approached it from an organizational theory perspective and grounded what we did in theory, which has yet to be done um, with chaplaincy services to this date. And then the paper was actually published in Healthcare Management Review, which is a journal that really aims to, um, is really have the target audience of healthcare management, those that are administrators and health, are administrators in healthcare um, and healthcare facilities. And so the practical implications and the way in which we framed this really focused on that audience rather than a chaplaincy audience. So the way in which I will talk about it today is to really help you all consider it from a chaplaincy perspective, but also for the fact, kind of identify the different factors that may be influential um, and may be need to, may need some additional um, attention from the management audience. Next slide. So a, a little bit about the introduction and background, and this is how we framed our research question, how we approached the approached kind of the purpose of the paper, um, is to really focus on patient-centered care. Patient-centered care is something that has grown in its attention ever since the Institute of Medicine had published Crossing the Quality Chasm in 2001, where it really advocated for six aims in which healthcare quality and service delivery needed to improve. Um, one of those had to do with centering our care delivery on patients' preferences, values, and beliefs. And we know as chaplains and those that are attentive to um, the way in which chaplains are integrated in health services delivery is that patients and caregivers' religious and spiritual needs are really important for how they cope, how they adhere to different medical guidelines, and ultimately make decisions about their care. Hospitals, on the other hand, have also provided spiritual care services, and they acknowledge that they improve the well-being of patients and staff, and, and that has been shown in research as well. And what we also see is that there are many hospitals that still do not provide chaplaincy services, and ultimately, that kind of led us to wonder about why. Why were it some hospitals provided chaplaincy services and some didn't? Um, and if they do provide chaplaincy services, why do they provide them without any financial incentive? Next slide. 
So the overall purpose was to really look at the organizational and environmental conditions that contribute to provision of chaplaincy services in adult acute care community hospitals between 2010 and 2019. And to do that, we decided to use some organizational theory, and I'm gonna let Daniel talk about that now. Next slide. So as uh, Dr. Wai just mentioned, there is an increased emphasis on chaplaincy services, spiritual care. And so in a way, we are framing uh, the provision of chaplaincy care as a as form of societal expectations on hospitals. So it, because the services are not billable, then you can also think about it as a unfunded mandate. And in a way, hospitals are under the pressure to provide the services. And um, so we configure, we, we, we this, uh, theorize that the environmental conditions, external pressures would uh, uh, compel some of the hospitals to provide the services. But the pressure will be filled differently by hospitals according to five different factors. Uh, they are sort of corresponding to sort of why, what, who, how, and where questions. Next slide. So the why condition, the why fact question in a way is related to the cause of uh, the pressure, which is uh, the societal expectation on hospitals to provide the services. And the, uh, by hospital by responding to the uh, expectation to provide the services, they will gain legitimacy. And the legitimacy, um, Excuse me, uh, I'm feeling, uh, uh, Chelsea, Kelsey, can you take over? I'm feeling, I'm feeling not well, sorry. Absolutely. It's okay, absolutely. So um, often that there are factors and sources that influence a hospital's experience of legitimacy and identification of, of, as to whether they're legitimate or not. So for, um, in particular related to chaplaincy services and the provision of chaplaincy services, there can be legitimacy gained from sources such as accreditation. And then there are also the factors related to organizational size. In other words, different professional chaplaincy groups can emphasize that, um, or have emphasized that perhaps the provision of spiritual care can be determined by the size of the organization. So the strategic contingency framework really says, Okay, so these factors can lead a chaplain or a hospital to conform to these expectations, and part of that is legitimacy. The next piece is the content of the expectation. So the content being um, the provision of spiritual care. And the two factors that we considered, or the theory kind of points to, is that there may be some compatibility between the content of the expectation and the way in which a hospital may try to mit um, achieve its missions or goals, right? And so how does a hospital's identity um, really align with the provision of spiritual care? And then also, is it aligned with teaching content? So if a hospital is a teaching hospital, is there an alignment between providing spiritual care or providing a more um, well-rounded um, content of um, teaching content uh, with the provision of spiritual care or having a chaplaincy services. Uh, the next part is the constituents expectation. So we considered that perhaps hospitals that have older populations or serve older populations, we know that they are, um, they're more likely to be religious and perhaps that expectation then would be for those hospitals to provide spiritual care. And then also that there are some higher levels of acuity in different hospitals. There has been documented evidence that um, or documented research that, that really says that the, that staff expect and anticipate chaplains to be present for end of life care. And in that case, it may be um, that there could be this expectation of staff as a constituent to have a chaplain service integrated uh, within the hospital. Next slide. And then the last two of the five that um, Daniel mentioned is that hospitals, we anticipate they will conform to the expectation to provide chaplaincy services because of control mechanisms. 
and considering environmental uncertainty. So when it comes to the control mechanisms, there really is very little actually that can control the provision of spiritual care. However, if a hospital is religiously operated or affiliated with a religious group, there could be more control over whether or not that hospital operates a chaplaincy service. Um, there is also a robust amount of literature within organizational theory that speaks to the level of environmental uncertainty and how um, the market conditions around a hospital can really impact its strategy um, and the, the ways in which it aims to survive or function within it particular context. So for example, in this case, um, we thought, well, if there's more competition within an area, um, then that hospital may be more likely to have a chaplaincy to port, um, service to actually gain um, a leg up in, in competition. Um, and then hospitals that are also part of um, health systems have more resources that are available. And so in that way, it really decreases that environmental uncertainty. And so those that are part of health systems may be more likely to uh, provide chaplaincy services. Next slide. So in the strategic contingency perspective, um, you know, again, saying that hospitals conform to expectations strategically in order to um, determine what services they provide. So that's kind of your summary of what um, that theoretical framework argues. We, um, again, set out to see like, what are the factors that are influencing whether or not hospitals have chaplaincy services? So we took um, secondary data, the American Hospital um, Association annual survey data and the area health resource file data um, at the county level and merged them with one another. So the American Hospital Association annual survey has reportedly um, a very high response rate um, every year at a voluntary survey, but they tend to average about 80% response rate um, from hospitals filling out information about themselves. And so we took that and merged it with county level characteristics about the hospital. So every, the county that the hospital was located in, there were characteristics that we merged from the area health resource file. Um, and we focused on adult acute care hospitals that were present in that survey from 2010 to 2019. Now, the sample that we used for analysis excluded hospitals that were outside of the U.S., like in U.S. territories. We also excluded Veterans Administration hospitals since they have um, had to have chaplaincy services since their inception. And we also excluded specialty hospitals, including and excluded pediatric hospitals, obviously. We wanted to make sure that our sample of hospitals were as consistent as possible across um, their financial mechanisms and were as comparable as possible. Next slide. Okay, so I laid this out in an image for you because um, that's often how my brain thinks. I hope that this helps. So the independent, the independent variables that we looked at, we can split them down in terms or break them down in terms of the components of the theory. So you talk about the cause um, of, of that expectation or the external term determination of legitimacy how we consider um, the content or the alignment between the expectation for spiritual care and the hospital's identity, then the expectations of the constituents, the control mechanism requiring the expectation of the environmental uncertainty. And then in the far right side are the variables that allowed us to um, kind of measure and indicate those different ideas and pieces. So we considered whether or not the hospital was joint commission accredited, the size, meaning the number of staffed beds the hospital had, uh, the ownership of the hospital, whether it was for-profit, non -for non-profit, government-owned, if it was a member of the Council of Teaching Hospitals. Uh, we considered whether um, the hospital had at least one ICU, if it was a trauma hospital, um, the percent inpatient days that were covered by Medicare, and then whether or not the hospital was church operated, Catholic church operated or another religious organization. And then finally for environmental uncertainty, we considered the, the market competitions or the number of hospitals in the county, as well as whether or not the hospital was a member of the health system. Next slide. Now, we also controlled for a number of different factors um, based on what existed in previous literature. 
So we know that hospitals that are critical access tend to have less um, resources and fewer specialty clinicians. We also controlled for whether or not the hospital was located in an urban or rural setting. Um, the percent of the inpatient days that are paid for by Medicaid, we controlled for, um, as well as the per capita income within the county. And finally, we controlled for the census region. Um, so this is a this is a longitudinal analysis, and it was done with a pooled panel logistic regression. So the outcome being having a chaplaincy department, yes, no. Um, and then we clustered our standard errors at a hospital level, but you know that that can be another session for another time. But um, I want to make sure to point out that we did a one year lag structure. Now, what that means is we didn't say, OK, the characteristics of this hospital in year 2010 and look at that in relation to ship to whether or not they reported a department in 2010. Rather, we said, OK, if we look at the characteristics of 2010, most likely those influenced the care, whether or not the hospital reported a department in 2011. And so the the characteristics of the hospital year prior to the reporting year are how we did our analysis, assuming that what was going on in the year prior ultimately was more influential than the reporting year in, to, in terms of having a chaplaincy department. Next slide. So I will get into the results now, and um, I would encourage you if you find this um, enthralling to read the article because there's a lot more there than I can provide in these slides. Um, but each year contained over 3,000 hospitals, and on average in a year, um, we had about 76% of the hospitals that had chaplaincy services. Um, over 60% each year were joint commission, commission accredited, again, on average. There was an average of approximately 166 staffed beds in these hospitals. 64% were nonprofit. Fewer than 6% were teaching hospitals. 75% had at least one ICU. Um, and again, this is the average over the 10 years. Um, and then 16% were church operator controlled affiliated, and those are also identified as nonprofit. Um, they operated in a county with on average eight other hospitals, and two out of every three belong to a health system. Next slide. Um, what this figure shows is that the percent of hospitals that reported a chaplaincy department each year, which is represented by the black bar, increased over the period that we studied. Um, so in 2010, about 73.7% .7 of the hospitals reported having a chaplaincy department. When you get to 2019, about 79.5% reported having one. And then you can also see the stripe line being the percent of hospitals that do not um, did not report having a chaplaincy department. Next slide. Um, so this has a lot of transitions. Uh, Andy, so you'll have to push the arrow when I say, um, we're gonna go, thank you, one, one by one. So when we look at the cause factors, um, both of those, both being joint commission accredited and the size, the hospitals were at greater odds of having a chaplaincy department. So as the size went up, uh, hospitals had a greater uh, uh, probability of providing those. Um, next, right. So then when we get to the content or the alignment between expectation and identity, all of those factors were positively associated with having a chaplaincy department. The ownership piece, nonprofit and government owned hospitals were at higher odds of having a chaplaincy department than those that than for profit hospitals. Next box. And then um, when it comes to the expectations of constituents, you can see that having at least one ICU and the Medicare patient load are both positively associated uh, with having um, a chaplain or reporting a chaplaincy department. Trauma being a trauma hospital, on the other hand, was not uh, sig significantly, statistically significant, although, um, anyway. Okay, so the control mechanism, so being church operated was at, um, hospitals that were church operated were at higher odds of having a chaplaincy department than those that were not church operated. And then when it comes to the context of the environmental uncertainty, uh, market competition actually was not associated with reporting a chaplaincy, chaplaincy department 
but being a member of a health system was positively um, associated in, and those that were members were um, had higher odds of doing that. Next slide. So um, in summary, we had a greater proportion of hospitals that um, over time that actually had chaplaincy services. And it seems like multiple factors were associated with the provision of chaplaincy services in these, in these hospitals. So all of the categories that we kind of identified, um, it, it, it fits to the theoretical framework, right? So that hospitals are strategically conforming um, to provide the service um, based on these factors. So the concerns for legitimacy, alignment between the organizational identity and the content of the expectation, the expectations of the constituents, so what people want and what they expect when they go to a hospital, uh, the focus on um, the consistency with organizational identity, and then, or it, it, although the um, pieces about the um, market competition were not influential, I actually was very surprised about that. Um, and then the inter-organizational connectedness and how um, hospitals may be associated with a system or have more flexible resources because of being in a system. Next slide. So for discussion and how we kind of made sense out of, um, of what we found is that perhaps uh, kind of the first thing um, is that perhaps not providing chaplaincy services was, limit, was tied to limited financial resources. So all of these things that um, we identified also influence financial resources and, and something that we mentioned needs to be examined and considered for future research or how are the financial metrics related to the provision of this, uh, of this service. When it comes to the influence um, of social legitimacy concerns, constituents expectations, and how the provision of spiritual care is really aligned with organizational missions and goals that really um, fits with what other research has been published at this point. Um, so in uh, management research and organizational theory, there is this uh, exploration of the role of organizational level cultural competency. And it may be that when organizations have higher levels of cultural competency, they are more likely to provide spiritual care services that the provision of this service may align with um, that organizational culture. Um, there is evidence from our colleague here at VCU, Laura McClellan, who has noted that uh, hospitals that emphasize staff support inclusive of uh, spiritual care actually perform better and do better. And it may be that those uh, hospital administrators that focus on staff support see this as a core component of that. Um, and then um, Wendy's research that actually has looked at um, what administrators report is that they do note that the provision of spiritual care is, is continued and done in a way that really helps them align it with the mission and the vision and the goals of the organization itself. Next slide. Um, and so for our, uh, just to remind you, the audience of the paper was hospital administrators and organizational decision makers. And so we pointed out a few practical implications that we want, we wanted that audience to consider. So in as much as we could control for, in a way, accrediting organizations influence, really, as many of you know, the Joint Commission requires a spiritual assessment, but does not provide further guidelines on who or how that is to occur, or even when that is to occur. And so it may be that accrediting organizations need more guidelines and perhaps hospital administrators in pressuring those organizations to provide them more guidelines may be um, an avenue that, that needs to be explored further. Um, there is also conversation, again, um, this may not be surprising uh, to, to you all as chaplains, but there is some level of reimbursement that may need to be considered. If patients and clinicians in acute service areas um, desire the service and recognize it is important, what role does reimbursement, whether it be um, a bundled payment or, or some other mechanism? Um, I know CMS, the changes within the coding in CMS is, a, is allowing for folks to begin to explore 
the data around the provision of these services, but how do we provide the support um, and really help increase the equitable level of the provision of care? So if it is that financial resources um, are determining whether or not hospitals are able to provide chaplaincy services, then do those financial factors um, identify another level of inequitable service provision that need to be considered to ultimately improve the quality of the health services that are provided. Um, and then when it comes to system level resources or interorganizational partnerships to provide, um, to expand the provision of chaplaincy services, you know, what, why is it that um, hospitals have traditionally operated and provided chaplaincy services in the way they do? Um, do administrators need to look to other organizations for those resources um, to be able to provide um, professional spiritual care in places that they have not in the past. And so those are some of the considerations that we've raised. Next slide. Um, and then of course, the future research. I think it's vital that we consider the financial, the role of financial metrics and access to spiritual care. Um, there is some important research I think that also needs to be done to consider how chaplains move from their training centers to hospitals with open positions and the pathway from training into professional roles. And then finally, um, some research that Daniel has done that has looked at the board, roles of boards of directors and their identities and the emphasis for diverse boards of directors. Could that actually be um, an avenue in which um, more attention and um, more a higher level of responsiveness to the provision of spiritual care is given um, in hospitals. Next slide. And that will be that. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, Wendy, just be, before um, uh, you begin your response, let me remind people that um, looks like uh, we've moved pretty well through the presentation. And I think there will be time for uh, questions and answers. So if people do have questions for uh, any of the presenters, uh, put them in the question box in the control panel, and, and we uh, look forward to getting to them uh, near the end of the presentation. Wendy, please go ahead. Super. Thanks, George. Kelsey, great to be with both of you. All the PC crowd, as always. Um, I really appreciate the chance to read the paper, think about it, and have a chance to talk with all of you about it. I have a couple of questions. I thought I would just lay out some of them might have answered, some of them might not. Uh, part of the Wendy, uh, having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. I don't know if it's just me, but if you can be closer to your microphone, maybe. Let's try that. Is that better? No. Hmm. Is that any better? It's much. Is that making a difference? It's much, much better. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, George, for letting me know that. So part of what I really like about this paper is the effort to engage with organizational theory. And when I was in graduate school, I took a course with Paul DiMaggio, um, who talks a lot about the institutional isomorphism that Kelsey and Daniel and their colleagues reference in the paper. And when sociologists talk about institutional isomorphism, in simplest terms, the question is, how do different organizations in a field or in a group come to be similar? And they talk about three different ways that this happens. They talk about normative approaches, coercive approaches, and mimetic approaches. Bottom line, forget all the fancy words. Normative approaches are those that professionals try to facilitate themselves through licensing, through credentials, through things about the professions that are doing the work in question. Coercive are policies, right? The state or the federal government passes a policy and everyone needs to follow it. That leads these organizations to be similar in that way. And the third kind of isomorphism they talk about is mimetic, which is basically the idea that organizations copy each other. That at a certain point, at a certain point it's, it's not cool if you haven't done X, and so you better do X if you still wanna be in the club. So part of what I was wondering as I was reading this paper and thinking about it is, what do we think the mechanisms might be that explain some of what is being seen here? So they lag the data by a year with the idea that things the year before might influence whether or not there's a chaplaincy presence now. And I was wondering, you know, we can see clearly that the profession itself has tried to address credentialing and other issues. So we can see the normative piece in play for chaplains. 
Um, there hasn't been a lot of movement on the coercive piece, that's the policy piece. And mimetic copying, I'm just not convinced that hospitals think that they have to have chaplaincy or spiritual care to be in the cool kids club. I'm happy to be told otherwise, and I wish that that were the case, but I don't see a lot of mechanism around the copying piece. So I guess I wondered if we could think a little about whether there's anything in the data or that we could extrapolate from the data that might help us think about what is causing any of the changes that are documented in the paper. So that's one sort of set of questions, issues we could think about. Um, the other kinds of questions and issues, you know, we're always troubled in these surveys about who it is that actually filled out the form and what they think chaplaincy is. And I don't think that Kelsey knows any more about that than any of us do, but if she has any insights, I'd love to hear them. I also appreciated that there was an option to sort of check off the type of chaplaincy, if it was partnership or, you know, what the different groups or kinds of chaplaincy were. And I wondered if the, these analyses were ran for, for the type of chaplaincy, if there's any kind of leverage to figure out there. Um, my third question is about the cross-sectional versus the longitudinal design. So it's always better, I'm teaching research methods this semester, and I tell the students it's always better to have longitudinal data. And so I'm curious if there are findings using the data longitudinally here that challenge some of the findings in the cross-sectional designs and how you think about those. I mean, in general, we think this is this longitudinal data is the best way to answer the questions, but I wondered about the cross-sectional versus longitudinal nature. And then the last thing I think I wanna talk about is the idea that Kelsey and Daniel and others started with that chaplaincy spiritual care is part of patient-centered care. I think we may think that, but if the administrators who are making the decisions don't think that, we have a problem. And so back to the question of, you know, the mechanism for change. When we interviewed healthcare executives, you know, just before at the beginning of the pandemic, they really talked about chaplains as doing a lot of work for staff more than patients. And so while we could certainly assert or lobby around the idea that chaplains are essential for patient-centered care, I wonder how we think about that given the little bit that we know about administrators and if that is the best best strategy. So to sum up, I kind of have four sets of questions or topics we could talk further about. One is about how institutional isomorphism happens and what the mechanisms are that might be explaining some of the changes that Kelsey and her colleagues see between the professionals, the policies, and the copying, not being a cool kid. Um, the second is whether there's any more information about how the dependent variable was measured or whether additional analyses were run based on additional details about the dependent variable that are indicative here. The third is whether there are differences in this analysis because it's longitudinal than from when people have done cross-sectional studies, sometimes with these same data. And the fourth is sort of how we think about the patient-centeredness of this, especially given the little bit we know about healthcare administrators in which they have tended to emphasize the role of chaplains for staff rather than for patients. So I think that Kelsey and her colleagues were really clear at the end about sort of what the next steps are from a research perspective, but I wonder if there are insights here for healthcare administrators or for people that have the, the institutional authority to make change and what we want to have them do. Thank you so much for this chance to be with you. I really appreciate it. Kelsey, do you want to um, respond to some of Wendy's comments? Uh, sh sure, I'm happy to, although I, I don't know that, um, hopefully I remember them all. Um, so I, I to speak to the, um, the part of the debate, the dependent variable and the different levels of chaplaincy um, service provision. So the the um, uh, American Hospital Association survey asks whether whoever's filling out the survey, whether or not the hospital has a chaplaincy department, yes, no. And then they ask it, but they ask it in like three different levels. So is it at the hospital? Is it the system? Is it a joint? Is it a joint venture? And so Early on in this effort, you know, we kind of did a dive into which hospitals are saying what. And it was not clear to us based on our professional networks, based on our knowledge of chaplaincy departments, that there was logical rationale as to why one person pot picked joint venture versus why one person picked hospital. And there were so few hospitals that actually kind of picked those other two, like system or joint venture, that um, we really weren't able to do a whole lot of analysis based on those different levels. Um, and so we we took those to say, okay, 
if they said yes to any of these, we're we're assuming yes, they have a chaplaincy department. And if they said no to all of them, then no, they did not um, to help. Now, in terms of, um, I think the mechan. Go ahead, George. While you're on the topic, actually, of of what it meant when a hospital checked yes on the survey. Uh, there's two questions in the chat that actually are related to that, so it may be useful to clarify. Um, so I'm going to uh, share both questions together because they're somewhat similar. What are the credentials of the chaplains within the department? Uh, and the other is, uh, how many of them were departments with professional chaplains versus volunteer chaplains? So um, why don't you take that? And uh, yeah, we don't know. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges with the AHA survey data is that, um, and I think, and Wendy mentioned this is one, we don't know who's filling it out. We don't know how much they actually know about chaplains. Could it be, you know, uh, an intern or a graduate student filling it out for the hospital? Um, or is it somebody who's actually administratively in charge of the hospital and has this understanding of, well, yes, we have a chaplaincy department. Um, AHA does also, also does not define what it means to have a chaplaincy department. So they do not distinguish between, well, we have volunteers that come in and say they're chaplains versus we have board certified chaplains who are employees um, and working as, in, in this hospital. Uh, and so there's no way with the data, and, and I will also say there is not data that exists to date um, at the hospital level. Um, it's kind of a life goal of mine. Um, that tells us about like, how many chaplains, how many are board certified in a hospital, right? And and what that looks like and how um, hospitals are actually providing chaplaincy services. We simply have this yes, no response um, to the question in, 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 in larger data set like this. Um, then there's no other data set that actually has this kind of measure either. A, a, a rich data set with extreme limitations in terms of what the yes means. Let's just put a plug in here for the fact that Transforming Chaplaincy is trying to uh, get beneath what the yes means. So uh, we're partnering with Kelsey and her colleagues at Virginia Commonwealth University to interview managers of spiritual care departments, hospitals that said, yes, we have a spiritual care department to kind of then say, well, tell us about your department. What are the services you provide? Who's providing them? Are they board certified, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not going to talk to all 3,000 hospitals that Kelsey used in this survey, uh, but we hope to begin to uh, answer the question, well, if you say yes, you have a spiritual care department, what does that mean in terms of what the services look like? So uh, stay tuned. We hope to have some answers uh, uh, related to that coming down the road. But uh, Kelsey, back to you in terms of uh, some of the other things Wendy raised. Yeah, I, I think when it comes to um, the me mimetic isomorphism that um, Wendy spoke about is, you know, I, I don't, I, it's hard to know and to guess kind of like what the mechanism is that is leading it if hospitals, um, so one of the challenges with, let me say this first, one of the challenges of this data set is that in as much as they have a very high response rate, that doesn't mean that every hospital is presenting is reporting every year. So, in as much as the data says, you know, 80% of the hospitals um, have chaplaincy department. Well, we had a very unbalanced data set to so from one year to the next, it was not always the same hospitals. And I'm working on another analysis, hopefully that can can actually show. Well, it has shown that more hospitals increased in. Um, increase the number of departments they had then lost them and that's a topic for another day um, but I you know I don't I think within this data to show that competition uh, was not influential kind of to me spec spoke to the mimetic piece like I'm not doing it because I'm trying to be like other ones or to compete with other hospitals within a particular area um, but rather could it be you know I'm I'm doing this because it's the way we've always done it or it's because um, it's what I'm being told is right um, by the folks and the constituents within um, within the walls of this building. Um, so I don't know that I have any more uh, a better insight into what mechanism is actually influencing the provision or in the 
increase in it um, at this point. I wonder if we can stay with that for a minute, uh, because one of the things um, um, that we see in your data is, is that um, over the 10 year period, there is a kind of 6% increase in the proportion of hospitals that are reporting chaplaincy. And then when we compare your study uh, with uh, the study that Wendy did, which was really the kind of pioneer piece, uh, looking at factors like this, and I'm forgetting the years that your project covered, Wendy, but you reported between 55 and 64% of the hospitals um, had spiritual care departments. And so um, between the end of your the data that you looked at, Wendy, and the beginning of Kelsey's data, we have um, about a 10% increase. And then across Wendy, uh, Kelsey's data, we have a 6% increase. So we are seeing this trend of an increasing proportion of hospitals that are reporting they do have spiritual care departments. Um, and and um, why is that? What's happening? Um, among the factors you examined, other factors that Wendy named, um, do we have some hunches ab about whether or not, in fact, that's real? There really is that an increase? Uh, and, and if there really is an increase, um, uh, what may be driving it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I think my my gut says there 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 might be an increase. Uh, there's an increase, whether or not it's as grand as um, it looks like. My data, ha I don't know. I I'm a hopeful optimist, but also a realist sometimes. And um, and and I, I you know I think there's an increase. What does that do to you? the pessimistic side of me? Says well, a lot of it may be due to um, mergers and different hospital systems really joining together and how that is affecting the distribution of resources uh, for the provision of spiritual care within health systems. Um, you know, there are hospitals, I think about uh, in Kentucky when I was there that when, um, you know, a large system comes in and buys multiple hospitals, then those hospitals, their spiritual care departments are technically connected. They may have had volunteers, or they may not have had a spiritual care department, but now at this point, the hospital can say, okay, I've got a challenge department. And that's my really cautious op, like perspective um, on, on, on the uh, more enthusiastic end. You know, I hope that it's the emphasis on um, whole person care and the way in which we are shifting, um, how medical education is shifting and how the training of other clinicians is changing to focus on um, whole person care and to think about how, think beyond the biomedical model um, and that that can lead people to uh, inquire and to explore other topics and other aspects um, of well being beyond the physical um, as well. Wendy, your thoughts of what may be driving these changes? Are they real? I think we don't know. I mean, I'm skeptical enough. I may not have Kelsey's optimism. I'm skeptical enough about the people who fill out the surveys and what they think counts as a chaplain, because, you know, they may say that the priest down the road counts as a chaplain. Um, so I, I just, I, I don't know. And it's hard because I feel like we hear anecdotally about departments closing. We rarely hear about departments opening. So um, I want to believe the numbers are going up, but I, I just think we don't know. Kelsey, Kelsey did refer to the fact that she has, within this data set, there's a, a sub-analysis that looked at um, how many hospitals reported the closing of a department over the 10-year period, how many hospitals reported starting a department over the 10-year period, and then there were a few that actually started and stopped and started again. Uh, and, and what she sees in that data is there actually are more that report starting than reported uh, losing. Um, so um, um, so it, it, I'm inclined to think there is some increase going on, um, but what are the factors that are driving that? And I, I, I kind of want to uh, highlight the, the grant that uh, Wendy, you and uh, the VCU colleagues have from Templeton, where you're going to be talking to healthcare uh, administrators um, to try to get some further information about 
what drives their decision making. I don't know if either one of you want to say more about that or um, at this point. <clears throat> It does feel like it, it would fill an important part of this puzzle. Yeah, Kelsey, do you want to say something or you want me to do the broad overview? Go ahead. So, I mean, I think we're trying to figure out how to bring chaplains and healthcare executives together to try to make some significant movement on these questions. And I think we know that it can't be either group by themselves. And so Kelsey and Laura, who was mentioned at the beginning of this um, webinar, are gonna do a mapping that Kelsey can say more about. And our goal is to work, a mapping meaning a, a big literature review, to help us figure out what we know about what interventions are in healthcare institutions that increase or expand uh, what chaplains are doing or where chaplains are. And then we're hoping, you know, fingers crossed, to get some additional funding that will allow us to support a set of demonstration projects to try to make the difference that is seen in the literature. Kelsey, you should say more. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think ultimately the goal is to increase the intentional or initiate maybe even the intentional conversation within um, management circles and um, groups around the provision of spiritual care and health care. Uh, so I don't know that there's ever been any intentional conversation, whether it be um, within um, schools that train MSHA students or Masters um, of Health Administration students who go on to be administrators of hospitals or within the professional circles that um, of healthcare administrators in intentional conversation about the provision of spiritual care and the importance of that. Uh, and so in, in kind of going and getting deep into the literature about the ways in which chaplains are integrated and intervene and um, provide support within healthcare institutions and bringing that information to health administrators um, to help not only build a pool of advocates and resources, but to expand the network and to expand the conversation beyond um, beyond the current places in which it's it's being had. And I think ultimately, you know, my goal in life is to really influence the way in which larger organizations um, attend to it. Like maybe AHA needs to change its question. We don't need to ask a yes, no question. Or the Bureau of Labor Statistics, perhaps we need to consider chaplaincy another profession um, that, is, that is separate from counselor or clergy. And to bring those that are making decisions and who have access to other people who make decisions at larger systems level, um, it's, it, we gotta start with first increasing their awareness and expose them to um, what exactly um, chaplains and spiritual care providers do. That's important work, and we're really looking forward to learning uh, from you as you're able to move forward with it. Um, I want to go back to a, a comment, Wendy, you made uh, about um, you know what may be driving um, um, development of spiritual care programs, and is it um, uh, Kelsey's kind of uh, um, proposal that its uh, hospitals are motivated by the patient-centered care uh, um, uh, ethos um, and that uh, providing good spiritual care is a key component to that. And Wendy, you were kind of picking up on um, the, uh, in the surveys um, that were done, you did, that we were part of, uh, around healthcare administrators, that they were kind of thinking about care for staff as an important part of what chaplains were providing. And, do we, do we have any hunches um, about the extent to which one or the other or some combination of those uh, factors um, are factors that are contributing to establishing spiritual care programs, maintaining spiritual care programs, expanding spiritual care programs? I have to say, Wendy, you, you referred a minute ago to the, the fact that we all hear about spiritual care programs that are have been cut or uh, reduced, um, and, and, and I have a hypothesis that, that, that for a variety of reasons, chaplains remember those stories and tell those stories um, more intensely than they remember the stories about departments that expanded. Um, so I tend to think that that um, is, um, distorts the uh, professional chaplain's perspectives of, of what's happening in the industry. But anyway, um, 
hunches? Is it patient-centered care? Is it staff support? Is it some of both? What does that mean for how we talk to our healthcare uh, decision makers and leaders? So I think we'll know more after we begin talking to more of the administrators. The project that Kelsey was describing will start in December. But I, my hunch post-COVID was that we might see expansion because of staff support, because of how much staff support chaplains did during the pandemic and how well it was received. Whether that's the case or not, we don't know. But I feel like um, when we first heard in the interviews with executives before the pandemic that there was such an emphasis in their mind on staff support, that was surprising to me given how often chaplains talk about their work with patients and families. But post-COVID, I thought that might change. And so my hunch would be that some of the growth may be related to staff support, especially as we see continued high turnover in nursing and a range of other healthcare professions. Um, you know, chaplains are a, an important bulwark against that, and they're much less expensive, frankly, than, you know, replacing some of these um, higher paid healthcare providers. But just, just a hunch. Yeah, I would I would echo what Wendy said. I think um, when you look at some of the um, literature around uh, the impact and patient experience and chaplaincy, what, what I see in the way in kind of which I am um, understanding what's going on is it really probably is the mechanism of how um, chaplains provide support to staff. Um, and I think that that's going to be critical. I will also say that all of the data that I looked at it is all pre-pandemic. So in as much as it looks like chaplaincy departments are, are increasing, you know, uh, we don't know how the pandemic impacted the prevalence of departments. And it may very well be that um, currently we're, we're really still focused on whatever may have, however that may have impacted the provision of spiritual care. Um, we, we just don't know. Um, yeah, we have a good question here from Melissa. Melissa's asking, uh, are there regional differences? Um, 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 you know, you included region uh, as a predictor, some hunch, you know, that in the Bible Belt, uh, is there a greater incentive for um, uh, healthcare uh, administrators to be sure they have strong spiritual care departments than up in Wendy's uh, secular New England? Um, and um, you want to mention what you found about regional difference? Yeah, um, so we actually didn't find um, that region was associated at all um, with having a chaplaincy department um, in, in, in the multi, multivariate models. So, so in other words, it didn't matter what region the hospital was in. Right, and so is that a contextual factor, right? In some sense, if you're thinking that uh, uh, th that what drives uh, decision making in healthcare is, in some sense, being responsive to the market. And if you're in a market where uh, uh, very highly religious uh, patients and families and staff, uh, you would think, okay, that's going to influence um, uh, decision from the hospital administrators to be sure they have a spiritual care department. Whereas <clears throat> um, uh, up in Vermont and New Hampshire, um, um, or out in the Pacific Northwest, more secular parts of the country, the market may not be expecting uh, spiritual care. And based on these data, turns out not to be a factor. Mm -hmm. That's a head scratcher. Okay. How could that be? Right. What's well, the there's a lot of things a, there, George. What's the incentive for a healthcare administrator in Oregon to provide spiritual care if people don't care about it? All right, so there's a lot more to learn. That, yeah, I don't think we have enough information, George. Opening the can of worms. Uh, um, and, and so we have one, one comment from a, a colleague in Washington State who says uh, the departments have been closed, but they actually have been reduced post-pandemic. Uh, in, in his experience. So um, more to learn. Um, it looks to me like um, uh, our hour is up. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us um, uh, for today's presentation. Particularly want to thank Kelsey and Wendy uh, for a wonderful data and a lively discussion. Kelsey, uh, give our best regards to Daniel. Hope he's feeling well. Um, and uh, as you uh, have heard us say, there's uh, an important uh, continuing questions that we don't have answers to. There's 
important areas of research that we're continuing to probe related to all of this. And so we look forward to um, um, doing that research um, and staying in touch with all of you to share the wonderful results. Um, Kelsey, Wendy, again, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, friends, we look forward to uh, having you join us again for our next webinar soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.